Welcome. You're about to listen to an encouraging, life-changing message presented at Joy Christian Center, Basildon. In His good and matchless name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome to the service this morning. Um, I trust that the Lord is going to speak to you today. Now, some of you may have uh, known that for some months, I think it's about a year and a half now, we have actually been studying the, the Gospel of John on Wednesdays. Every Wednesday we've been taking uh, you know, a portion of the Gospel of John and we have just about round up, rounded up um, chapter 19. But in the process of studying the book of John, we came across the seven signs uh, that John, seven signs that Jesus did, which John recorded, and the seven I am statements that Jesus also uh, made, and John also recorded them. In fact, John recorded in his gospel, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the door of the sheep, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. These are the seven I am statements that John recorded in his gospel. And so for the next few weeks, we are going to um, be looking into these seven I am statements that Jesus made so we can draw out some life-changing principles for daily living. Amen? Now we're going to do this because we believe by doing this it is going to help you understand and also remind ourselves of who Jesus is and what his mission is and how we can come into the fullness of what God has for us in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so if you have your Bibles, and I'm sure you do, don't come to church without a Bible, go to John chapter 6, and I'll be reading from verse 26 to 42. John chapter 6, we are going to be reading from the New King James Version. John chapter 6, verse 26 to 42. Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, can you adjust my thing so it doesn't make too much noise, please? Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal, to everlasting life. That's the word which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. What sign will you perform then? that we may see it and believe in you. That's an interesting one. What work will you do? And then they came up with a suggestion. Our fathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written. They even quoted the scripture. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. Please underline that portion, it's important. You have seen me, and yet do not believe. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. 
And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that, all, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me. That everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For the Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says... I have come down from heaven. And we are always blessed by the reading and doing of God's word. And I do pray that Almighty God will give us understanding as we discuss this and as I preach and as I teach this, that God will give me clarity of thought. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Now, this morning we are talking about Jesus, the bread of life. He says, I am the bread of life. In fact, in, chap in ver chapter 6, verse 35 to 37, Jesus, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you, you have seen me and yet do not believe. The word yet there suggests that these people have Witness Jesus. Jesus was in their midst. They have seen him, but they are struggling. They have not yet come to believe in him. You have seen me, but you, and, and yet you do not believe. And all that the Father gives me will come to me, Jesus said. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Now, before Jesus ever made this statement or before he spoke these words, he had already from chapter 1 of John, uh, verse 1 of John, chapter 6, right up to verse 15, John actually recorded one interesting and very powerful sign that Jesus did. Amen. Because he had gone to a, a hillside or a mountainside across the Lake uh, Galilee, which is also known as the Sea of Tiberias or the Lake of Tiberias. Jesus has gone. It's a huge body of water. Jesus has gone across that, you know, maybe to retreat a little bit with his disciples. And as they were there, the Bible says Jesus lifted up his head and he saw a crowd coming. It was a, a huge number of people, mighty crowd. And as soon as Jesus saw them, he said to uh, Philip, where can we buy bread that these may eat? Where can we buy bread that these may eat? And Philip said to him, Lord, 200 worth, uh, 200 dinaras worth of bread will not be enough to feed these people. Praise God. Now, I have explained before that the Bible has different uh, monetary units, okay, for different things. We have the denier and then we have what we call a talent, okay? A talent is equal to a 20 years worth of a laborer's wages, but a denier is a one day wages of a laborer. So Philip was saying that Jesus, even if we should volunteer, our daily wages, 200 of us should volunteer our daily wages, it will not be enough to buy bread for the crowd. There was many of them. Hallelujah. But John recorded, John added that Jesus knew what he, was, he, he would do already. So he was asking Philip that question to test him. It was a test. Amen. God tests us. He doesn't tempt us. Praise the Lord. Somebody say God tests us. But he never tempts us. Amen. It's only the devil who tempts us. Amen? God tests us because he wants to promote us. The devil tempts us because he wants to demote us and he wants to destroy us. Praise the Lord. So God never tempts anybody. He tests us. Praise the Lord. So when, when, when 
Jesus asked these questions and Philip said that then Andrew, the Bible says, the brother of Simon Peter, he turned around and, and he said to Jesus, oh, uh, Jesus, th there's a, a little lad here with five loaves of bread and two fish. Then Andrew added, but what is this among so many? And Jesus said to them, make the people sit down. Hallelujah. Make the people sit down. Make them sit down. So everybody sat down. And then the Bible said Jesus took this young lad's pack lunch. He blessed it. And he distributed it. And the Bible said that there were over 5,000 men. The men numbered 5,000. The men alone. So if you add women and children... How do I know children were there? Well, it was a little boy's pack lunch that Jesus blessed. And the Bible says that everyone had more than enough to eat to the point that there were leftovers. And so Jesus said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that nothing is lost. L let me just pause here for a, uh, for a minute and, and say something to you that, listen, when this young lad went to the mountainside to see Jesus Christ, he had a packed lunch which was meant for just him. It has been prepared. Probably his mom just packed something enough for him alone. But little did this young boy know that his packed lunch was going to feed a whole city even to the point where it will become history. Hallelujah. You see, you need to be careful when Jesus asks questions. When God asks questions, you need to be careful because he's about to do something that will blow your mind. Because where they were, there were no shops, no market, nowhere they could get food. So he asked the question, where can we buy bread that these may eat? And Philip said, forget it. Even 200, you know, daily wages, worth of daily wages, if we use that to buy bread, it will not be enough for them. So economically, they, they can't handle the situation. But the Bible says Jesus knew what he would do already. Jesus always knows what he would do in your situation. The, most of the time, it's our problem. But the interesting thing I notice is that this pack lunch that Andrew said, what is it among so many? In other words, it was even ridiculous to suggest that Jesus do this because you have a huge crowd coming. Here is a little boy with five loaves and two fish. And he looked at it and he said, oh, Lord, there's pack lunch here, but, you know, I can just imagine the way he made his face, like I'm making my face. I don't know, what is this among, <laughs> I'm sorry I even suggested. Jesus said, make the people sit down. That five loaves and two fish was enough. So when he took it and he blessed it, everybody ate. You see, it is important for you to understand that God loves to specialize in the little things of life. When we learn to trust him with our not enough. Because when he asked the question, he wanted the people, his disciples, to focus their faith on him and not on the situation. But they were all looking at the situation economically, and even physically, Lord, we haven't got money. That is the economical one, economical answer. Lord, there's bread here, but it's not enough. Physically, this is impossible. Make them sit down. Because with God, all things are possible. So Jesus fed these 5,000 people. And the Bible said, interestingly, somewhere around the verse 14 and 15, when Jesus had fed these 5,000 people, and they saw the sign that he had done. You know what the people said? All of them said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. And they wanted to take Jesus and make him their king by force. They wanted to force Jesus to make him their king. Why were they trying to make Jesus their king by force? And have you ever wondered why Jesus... Most of the time and often uses 
basic staple foods like bread, water, milk, and wine to communicate how we are, to, uh, how we are meant to relate to him because he had said, I am the bread of life. Amen. And it's interesting to note that he said, I am the bread of life, not the bread for life. Because if you use the word for, it changes the meaning of what Jesus was saying. He didn't say, I am. In other words, you, you, he is not, um, you know, a little, if you like, dessert to life. But he said, I am the bread of life. Are you following? I am the bread of life. Have you ever wondered why Jesus used such language to communicate how we are meant to relate to him? Well, according to Abraham Maslow, an American psychologist, there are seven basic things humans need to survive. Seven. Some people will say five, some people will say six. It depends on where they are looking. But I like Maslow's uh, you know, categorization. The first one, he says, we all need air to survive. We need water to survive. We need food to survive. We need shelter to survive. We need safety to survive. We need sleep. Amen. Somebody say sleep. sleep. Mm. This is not an attack against those who work night. But we need sleep. Sleep is a basic necessity that we need in order to survive. If you are not sleeping enough, you can tell. Your body tells you something is wrong. Amen? Amen? A short while ago, I mean a few months ago, for the first time ever in my life, I met somebody that doctor prescribed sleep for him. That your medication is sleep. You have to sleep from this time to that time. You know, that was the prescription. Sleep is important. Amen? Don't look at me. I won't tell you whoever it is. Amen. And the seventh thing we need to survive, Maslow said in some cases we even need clothing to survive. Okay, if you live in places like Alaska and Siberia, my friend, you don't walk out bare chested, okay? You freeze to death in a matter of seconds. In a place like that, you need clothing to survive. So there are seven basic human needs that we all need. And so when Jesus said that I am the bread of life, that statement actually covers the whole of the spectrum of human existence. And what he's saying is that you need me to have life. And I'm going to unpack that in a minute. Amen? Amen. But interestingly, the reason why these people wanted to make Jesus, they are king by force, is that when our basic human needs are not met, we will not survive. But when these needs are met, it is equally true that we will do whatever it takes, whatever we can, you know, first of all, to maintain the supply of that need. And if possible, Whoever met the need or promises to do so, we will make that person our leader. That is why politicians always win when they come to us and they promise us we will reform education, we will cut taxes, and because they always address things to do with our basic human existence, our human needs. They touch on those things and we vote for them, only to get there and say, ooh, ooh, thank you very much for voting. But, uh, and then they come out with the explanation how they can't do this. Things. So these people were not different at all. What they wanted to do with Jesus. Be because basically, in their minds, you know, imagine. You, imagine you being among this uh, 5,000 plus people that day. You follow Jesus Christ. You've seen him heal the sick. You've seen him do some miracles. And you're thinking, wow, this guy is amazing. You followed him all day. And you got to this point where you are hungry. No market, no shop, no restaurants around. And all of a sudden, uh, here comes bread. Amen. Fish sandwich. More than enough for you. And you ate so much that you couldn't eat anymore. They all looked at Jesus and they said, surely... This is the prophet who is to come into the world. Surely, this is the prophet. They wanted to make him king. Everybody thinks the best of you when you meet their need. 
it is when people feel they are met, they are, they are felt need is not met that they begin to turn the heat on you. So they wanted to make Jesus their king. But the Bible says Jesus withdrew from them and went to the mountainside by himself. Then his disciples left. And then the, 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 later on, Jesus had to walk on water. It's in, in, in the same John chapter 6. He has to walk on the water more than four miles to go and catch up with his disciples who were rowing on the boat to get to the other side. Then this crowd followed Jesus. They went to the other side. Why? Because their needs have been met. There, there's a reason I'm sharing this because I'm coming to you in a minute. And then when they got to the other side, when they saw Jesus, they said, Oh, Master, when did you come here? And Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me not because you saw the sign. You seek me because you ate bread. Praise the Lord. Did you get the message? There are many people today who falls into this category. They want Jesus not because they see him as the Messiah, as their Lord and personal Savior, and want to walk with him for the rest of their life. They see Jesus as the man who pro produces bread. Who wouldn't want to eat miraculous sandwich? I would like some miracle sandwich. How about you? I like to see that every day. In fact, they told Jesus, and, and when they met with Jesus, look at <laughs> <laughs> oh, these people. Look at what they said to Jesus. Somewhere around um, verse number 35. No, no, no. Let's go to verse uh, 28. Then they said to him, okay, this is after they came to him the following day. They came to Jesus. They found him because they've eaten bread. So they found him. They found him. You know, I can think of those people who go around looking for prophets, you know, to prophesy into their life. Okay? Yeah, I, I know some people who never come to this church because I don't prophesy. I don't tell people I see, I saw. It's very quiet. Jesus answered, verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. You see, that those basic needs were met. Hunger. They were filled, so they want more. So they kept on looking for Jesus. And Jesus quickly said to them, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. This is what Jesus wanted them to see. That God the Father had appointed him and anointed him as the Messiah, the bread of life. My friend, if you follow physical things and you change after physical things, you will actually be under the control of whoever meets that need. Do you follow? But when you see Jesus as the bread of life, my friend, you don't need to change after everything because you have everything you need. Amen. And Jesus wants to see, wants us to see that he is the one that God has set his seal upon him. But these people were saying, you are the man, you are the man. We want to make you our king. Not because they have actually recognized him as the Messiah, but they have recognized him as the one who gives bread. And most of us are like that. We love Jesus because of the feelings we get on Sunday. The worship was good. We had good bombs. We were able to cry during the service. The Holy Spirit touched me. So Jesus warned these people. He says, do not labor for the food which perishes. Verse 27. It says, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, he was giving us a hint that we need him to survive. Just as food and drink are digested and give strength to the one who has eaten it, so those who eat the bread and drink the wine and clearly accept that they are symbols of his body and blood 
would receive real benefits. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. John 6 verse 55. That's what Jesus said. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm sharing these things to help you understand how we can actually enjoy life and satisfaction in Christ when we begin to see him as the bread of life, not the bread for life. Because as human beings, we don't live to eat, we eat to live. I know maybe you've met a couple of people who, you know, live to eat. But we need food to survive. We eat so we can live. Praise the Lord. We eat so we can live. Quickly, I want to share with you six benefits of the bread and wine. Because Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Now, when we see Jesus as the bread of life, there are six benefits that we receive, and it's all here in John chapter 6. The first benefit is this, we will have life in us. Please notice this is life. Okay? Life as we know it. It says we will have life in us. Verse 53. It says, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink the blood, of, and the, and drink the blood you have no life in you. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man. When Jesus said that, he was not telling them to literally eat him. But that's how the people understood. You see, because they were focusing on bread, physical bread. They were not looking at the spiritual uh, aspect of what Jesus was saying. Because they want more bread all the time. Praise the Lord. There are some people who can't wait for International Day to come because there will be food. Amen? We, we don't leave for International Day. Amen? We do International Day in order to accomplish something. That is not why we exist as a church. Two, we will have resurrection life and be raised at the last day. Now, when we see Jesus as the bread of life and we eat him, I'm talking about the communion now, and we eat the bread of life, what it signifies is that we will have, okay, the resurrection life and we will be raised at the last day. This is what guarantees that at the last day, Christ will raise us up when we die. He says in chapter, uh, verse 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. Did you see that? You have the resurrection life. The life that never dies. It will be resurrected. What does that mean? Hope. Amen. Hope of eternal life. Number three. The third benefit. We will be strengthened. It says for my flesh is food indeed. And my body is drink indeed. So again we will receive strength. That's verse 55. Verse 56 says that. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. So that is saying that we will know what it means to abide in Jesus. The fifth benefit. We will know the life of Christ within us. Verse 57 says, he who feeds on me will live because of me. Somebody say, I will live. Because of Jesus. And number six, he who eats this bread will live forever. John chapter 6, verse 58. Now, live forever here is talking about eternal life. Listen, some people, in fact, all of us, when we die, including unbelievers, we will be uh, resurrected. We will rise again. But the truth is that we will all not spend eternity in the same place. There's a place called hell and there's a place called heaven. The Bible teaches that the Christian, the one who believes in Jesus Christ, will go to a place called heaven. The question I want to ask this morning, as we continue, is that do you experience or have you been experiencing these six benefits in your life? As a Christian, do you experience that? Are you experiencing uh, life because you are a Christian? 
Because you are born again. Do you have the resurrection life in you? Do you have the witness that I have a resurrection life in me? Do you have strength in the Lord? Do you feel strengthened as a Christian? Do you know what it means to abide in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you have a witness of the life of Christ in you? And do you have eternal life? Do you know that? Do you experience this things on a daily basis? If you do, keep on doing what you are doing because you are on the right track. But if you are not doing so, then I want to help you. Let's together find out what is missing. Why are you not experiencing this? And to do this, I want us to go to Paul's teaching. Look at briefly at Paul's teaching, what Paul said about the communion. That will help us connect and find what the missing link is. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 to 22. Now, in giving these instructions, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 to 22. Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are, uh, those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. So here Paul is addressing a very important uh, problem in the Corinthian church. And by the way, when you look at the Corinthian church, first impression, I mean, you, you will be clapping your hands and toe tapping for this church. Because if you read the rest of Corinthians up to chapter 11, you will see where Paul talked about the fact that this church lack, they, they don't lack anything when it comes to the spiritual gift. All the spiritual gifts were in that church. When it comes to prophesying, speaking in tongues, you know, all the interesting gifts that some of us so covet, they were all present in the Corinthian church. This is a church that was going places. There were rich people and poor people, you know, diversity in the church. But there was a problem in the sense that it was reported to Paul that when the Corinthian church comes together, there was a division. They gather to break bread together. They gather to celebrate Jesus, the bread of life, and break bread together to symbolize that we are one in Christ, and in Christ we all have, you know, uh, uh, everything in common. But it, it so happened that some people were so spirit, super spiritual, and that when they come, they, eat their, they go ahead and eat their supper and everything. Somebody who didn't have goes hungry, and they don't care. So the apostle wrote to them and said, no, 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 no. That is not the way to do it. But it gets more serious. If you go to uh, verse 23, verse 23, Paul now tells them, when I taught you about the communion by implication, this is what he's saying. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. So Paul is saying that when we taught you about breaking bread and eating communion and having fellowship together, this is a revelation I received from Jesus. It was not from my mind. This was not the idea of man. This was coming from God. When we say you should break the bread, the body of Christ, take the, uh, the wine and the blood of Christ, it says this is something the Lord himself taught me. And I pass it on to you. And the apostle says that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, another basic necessity of life. He took bread and when he had given thanks, again, just like he did with the five loaves, he gave thanks. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take it. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Then Paul said, verse 26, 
For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So the communion is not about whether you have or you don't have. It's about remembering Jesus. It's about proclaiming the death of Christ until he comes. So we are affirming our faith that we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, but by taking the communion, we are also affirming that we have the resurrection life in us as Christians. And we are also declaring that all the six benefits of the body of Christ should manifest in our bodies. In other words, we should have strength. We should manifest the eternal life. Amen? We should have a victorious Christian life. But look at what Paul says, verse 27. The Corinthian church, who were not discerning the body of Christ, perhaps they saw Jesus as the man who just gave bread to everybody. Oh, this guy is there to meet my need. And not forget about the other body. Isn't that what is happening in the church today? Each one for himself, God for us all. We are all in the big, the mighty, bless me club. So every individual comes to church with an agenda. And more often than not, it is how I wish God will bless me. God, give me a new car. Give me a new house. God, heal me. God, touch me. They are not wrong. If we are doing that to the neglect of others, it is wrong. So Paul said, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. Somebody say examine himself. In other words, watch out. Watch out. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, somebody say for this reason. Now Paul is going to show us the missing link. Paul is going to show us why Things doesn't seem to be okay with us. Although we pray, we fast, we may even read the Bible, we may even take the communion, but wrongly. Now he's about to show us why things are not okay with us. So he says, <laughs> verse 30, For this reason, many are what? Many are what? Many are what? And again, many are and. Now, when we look at the six benefits of the communion, did you see anything about weakness and sickness in there? In fact, the third one says, we will be strengthened. John 6, 55 says, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. You will receive strength. Just like physical food gives you strength, Jesus said when we recognize his body and we do it properly, we receive strength. What is that strength? Physical and divine strength. Hallelujah. Amen. But the Corinthians missed it, so they were weak and sick. Let's continue. So many are, not even a few, he says many are weak and sick. Now, this weakness is not even talking about just, you know, feeling weak. It's part of it. But I also believe that this weakness is talking about some people in the church are even morally weak because it was in this same church that Paul had to rebuke them that they should be ashamed because there was a young man in the church who, for some reason, has decided to sleep with his father's concubine, his father's wife, because people have many wives in those days. And one of his father's wife was probably young enough. I don't know, maybe old enough, but cute enough. But all the same, foolish enough. And this boy was sleeping with his uh, father's girlfriend. And everybody in the church knew. And nobody rebuked him. You see our problem there? Because probably this church was thinking, ah, who am I to judge? Who are we to judge? Hey, me... I didn't come here. There's a saying in, in where I come from. They say, I came to light fire. I didn't come to look in your soup. Okay? Me, I came to church to worship my God. I didn't come to look for trouble. 
So they are there. And they don't realize that the scripture teaches that a little leaven leavens the whole lamp. That one bad apple will spoil the rest. And they were comfortably, you know, carrying on as if there was nothing wrong. And Paul said, you ought to be ashamed. So when he's talking about many of you are weak and sick, yes, some may be physically weak, but I believe that there were many of them who were also morally weak. This is because they took the things of God for granted. So these are people, there were people in the Corinthian church who couldn't resist temptation. When they see a lady with mini skirts, they want to go to bed with that. Whether they are married or not. So he said, many of you are weak and sick. And, and oh, you see, the weak and sick people in the church, we can do something about. But there's another category that Paul mentioned that when that happens, that one we can't do anything about. He says, and many, many of you sleep. That word sleep is not where you go to bed to rest and close your eyes. They're dead. This is talking about premature death. Premature death in the church. Young people were dying before their time. And Paul is linking this thing to the fact that the people of God were not taking the communion in a worthy manner. They're not recognizing the body of Christ. They are looking at it in terms of physical things and something to be toyed with. And there are many people today that don't see Jesus as the bread of life, as what we need to survive. We just see Jesus as somebody who numbs our pain every Sunday. And so Sunday you come, you get a good message, and you've, you know, you've, you've had your, uh, what do you call it, anesthetics. You are numbed. Okay, hopefully by Wednesday, you know, morning, it wears off. And if you have time, you come for Wednesday evening and you get a supplement again. And by Friday, Saturday night, it wears thin. And then you come again. And so every Sunday you come for your injection. And you're having repeat prescription in the church. That is not the way to live. He says that many sleep. And then look at what he says. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Start showing concern. Where is this brother? Where is this sister? I didn't see this person in church today. Call them. Why didn't you come to church and find out? Praise the Lord. My brothers, God's word is a revelation of his will. And we have just read that Jesus is the bread of life. That means when you believe in Jesus, in the word of God, and you repent of your sins and you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he becomes your bread of life. He becomes the bread for your life. Amen? The bread of your life. That means it becomes everything you need to survive. Is Jesus everything you need to survive? Or you only remember him on Sunday? Praise the Lord. When I was reading this and I was looking at this, you know what I said to myself? I said, if this is the case, and lately I've been having some, you know, health challenges. And I was saying to myself, if this is the case, then I need to watch how I take the communion and how I actually, you know, view Jesus in my own personal life. Because I want to experience all the six benefits. Praise the Lord. And I usually don't take the communion for granted. It's a serious thing to me. If you come to my office, you will see I have bread and wine there. From time to time, I would, I mean, spend time in the presence of God and I'll have communion. Maybe I need to teach some of you how to do it. Don't just get up and do it because if you do it unworthily, Paul says you're drinking judgment on yourself. Amen. But there are times where I feel it is important. I will break bread on my own in the presence of God and have the communion. Hallelujah. Do you, do, you, do you have family time and you have communion? Sweet, that we need to be doing this. We need to start doing it again. Have communion as a family. 
This is where the husband, you sit down as the head of the family. And you reveal Christ to your family and break bread together. And cast out demons and cast out the devil. Because we have the bread of life. My friend, we've got the bread of life. We have eaten the bread of life and some of you are still hungry. And some of you are still thirsty. Why is that? Then it's, it's not God's fault. It's not Jesus' fault. It's our fault. Because God is not a liar. Amen. He's not a man that you should lie, nor the son of man that you should break. Whatever he says, he will do. It's serious business because, listen, Jesus will come anytime soon. And it's about time we recognize him for who he is. And let's stop all this, uh, you know, Sunday, prophesy to me. You know, bless me, speak to me. Hey, I want prophecy. The other time we were doing something, I think uh, we are trying to do an advert or something like that. And Comfort said, Pastor, you know, why don't you... Put it there, signs and wonders, you prophesy to people, you know, pastor, people will come. Because she's, she got frustrated, you know, tired of, we, we telling people, come, come, and, and nobody wants to come. And yet when we announce that there's a prophet coming, hey, the whole house is filled. People will even sit where I sat. <laughs> when I come, they won't move. They say, oh, pastor, welcome. Pastor, <laughs> can I find a seat for you? They won't move because they want to receive prophecy. They will come. Those who don't sit in front, that day, they will sit in front. Because so that when the anointing comes from the prophet, they want to receive the same prophet. You see, you are chasing bread, not because you have seen the sign. Amen? Amen. Don't chase bread. Interestingly, God has promised in his word that seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Okay? And what did he say? He says, all other things shall, shall be added unto you. Can I ask you an honest question? Since you became a Christian, has other things been added to you? Examine yourself. Amen. This is Bible now. Ha no, no, no. My friend, you found your job. I'm not talking about things you got yourself. Has things been added? Added to you things you didn't work for. Been added to you. How often? Because it says all these things. What are those things? Things. All of it. It will be added to you. You know, people will bless you with stuff. Amen. Because you are in the right place. Because your heart is in the right place. It's not about coming to church. Hey, our pastor is funny. I've decided to stop that funny thing again. Because it's not helping you. Honestly, I think some people have turned me into their Sunday you know, stand-up comedian. You, 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 you've... <laughs> but in, in concluding, I want to finish around here. When I saw this, I was saying that, listen... John chapter 6 goes up to verse 70, I think 71 or 72 or something, 71. When I looked at it, I mm -hmm. said, we want to take one of the I am statement and do it every week for the next seven weeks. When I look at it, I'm, I'm thinking, even the I am, the bread of life alone, we need like three weeks to unpack everything. Are you ready for that? Yes. Maybe we'll do it till we go to camp meeting. Hallelujah. Amen. Is Jesus your bread of life? Now listen, when you have Jesus, there's, there's a song we sing uh, in Ghana and it, it basically says that if you have Jesus, you have everything. If you lose Jesus, you've lost everything. Jesus is everything. He is the bread of life, not the bread for life. Are you getting it? You see, when Jesus is the bread for life, it means you have what you're going to eat every day. You won't need him. But he's the bread of life. In other words, he is necessary for every single day that you live. That is why you have to talk to him every morning. In fact, every day you need to talk to him because he is the bread of your life. He is the nourishment for you. 
Praise the Lord. Look at how Psalm, Psalm 1, verse 1 to 6 put it. Lord, help me not to spend too much time on this one. It says, I, I want to read it from the uh, um, CEV, okay, or NCV rather, the, the New Century Version. Look at what it reads. It says, happy are those who don't listen to the wicked, who don't go where sinners go, who don't do what evil people do. They love the Lord's teachings. Do you love the Lord's teachings? Not only do they love the Lord's teachings, he says, and they think about those teachings day and night. They meditate. To meditate means to think about them. Do you love the Lord's teaching? Do you think about it day and night? Oh, oh. They think about it day and night. Verse 3 says, they are what? Weak. Is somebody here? He says, they are strong like a tree planted by a river. The tree produces fruit in season and its leaves do not die. Everything they do will succeed. But the wicked, here is the contrast. But the wicked people are not like that. They are like chaff that the wind blows away so the wicked will not escape God's punishment. Sinners will not worship with God's people. This is because the Lord takes care of his people, but the wicked will be destroyed. If you look at the last three verses, okay, it is telling you the end of what will happen to the people they mentioned from the first three verses that you are not supposed to be like them. Uh, if you read it in the New Kingdom, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. In verse 4, it says, The ungodly are not so. They are like the chaff that is driven by the wind. Therefore, they will not stand in the day of judgment, nor will they have a portion in the congregation of the righteous. So the first, when he says that, you know, do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, he tells you in the end why you shouldn't do that, because he says they are end. It's not going to be nice at all. And you don't want to be part of that. You see, for me, this is what Jesus is. That as you trust in him, the Bible says you will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, okay, whose leaves do not wither. Do you know what it means for your leaves not to wither? Huh? You will not be dry spiritually. Amen. And he says you will bring forth fruit in your season. You will bring forth fruit in what? You will be fruitful. You will bring forth fruit in your season. The Bible also tells us in Joshua, I believe Joshua 1, you know, 8 or somewhere, it says this, this book of the Lord should not depart out of their mouth, but you should learn to meditate therein day and night. Okay, and then to observe all that is written therein, then you shall learn to make your way prosperous and you will have good success. My friend, my brother, my sister, God wants good things for you and for us. Our problem is the battle we face on a daily basis, the challenge. I face them too, and I know you face them. But constantly, I have to return to the word of God. Constantly, in my own mind, I have to return to the word of God and use the word of God to fight all those things that will make me see Jesus. Less than who he is. Because as a pastor, I can easily reduce this to a profession. Yeah? Every Sunday I wait, uh, Sunday morning I open the Bible, look at a couple of verses uh, because naturally I can talk, you know, I'm a good talker, I can convince you to stop using your left eye, you know. So I'll, I'll look for a couple of verses, put them together, come and shout and sweat, somersault, call a, a few people for it, push them down, you know, and then, and then we take offering and then I go home. But if I do that, then I am walking in the counsel of the wicked and I'm sitting in the seat of the scornful. And what it says in the end of Psalm 1, 
That is what will be my portion, but God forbid. Praise the Lord. That is why it is my desire that in this church, we will do everything we can by the grace of God to make sure that we tell you to the best of our ability what we know and believe is the truth. Amen? Amen. No gimmicks. That is why I'm not here to play any gimmicks with you. My, my, my aim is to call you today, my friend. Maybe the Jesus you are having is just the Jesus who is giving you bread every Sunday. I, I want you to make Jesus your bread of life today. You're going to pray in a moment and tell God that Jesus, enough of this hide and seek. Jesus, I'm tired of being weak. I'm tired of struggling. I'm tired of not having enough. I'm tired of, you know, I sow and then somebody else comes to harvest what I have sown. You know, when we are doing that, like the Apostle Paul said, the missing link. Amen. Listen, I am not talking about the fact that you are not born again. No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. I am not talking about the fact that you have not repented. Maybe if you haven't, you should. But I'm talking about the fact that you know genuinely you are born again. You know sincerely that you want to serve God, but somehow things are not working for you. You tried it and you tried it and you tried it and you tried it, but it's not working for you. You take one step forward and you take ten steps back. Every single year, there is a disaster of some sort in your life. Praise the Lord. Let me ask you this before we pray. Suppose you know a gentleman, a young guy, let's say somebody 35 years old, okay? He's graduated from university. He's got master's degree or doctorate. And uh, he started a business and the business collapsed. Then he decided, no problem. I'll do something else. So he started uh, something else and then bought a new car and a new house. And he went out in his new car. The car crashed and uh, they discharged him from the hospital. He came home. Two days later, the house caught on fire. What would you say to that person as a Christian? You're going to say to him, hey, brother, I don't know what you are into, but all these signs I am seeing in your life, they are reminiscent of a curse. There's a curse on you. We need to pray and pray. Isn't it? That doesn't look like blessing to me. Praise the Lord. I'm not saying that if you are blessed, bad things could not happen. It could happen, but the thing is it won't crash you. Praise the Lord. So we need to be in a place where we are like a fruitful tree. We are producing fruit. I want to see you next year. You know, you've progressed. You've, you've gone to another level because you, you, you have made Jesus your bread of life the bread of your life that you say to him you are my necessity daily will i seek you daily will i call upon you daily will i look into your word so i will nourish my soul the bible says that when we do that whatever your hand touches will be blessed you will be in a place where in fact you don't even have to pray for hours anymore you know those prayers you are praying the complaint prayers, Father, in Jesus' name, you said you will bless me. Lord, I have waited six months. The blessing hasn't come. Father, if you don't do something, I'll backslide. Oh. You are serious. I mean, serious. Hey, some people pray like that, you know. If you don't do something, Lord, I'm going to backslide. No, you backslide and see who loses. Praise God. Please rise right now. I hope you've been challenged enough.